And this is the actual, the, the actually like this is the main thing that heals. This is the most important aspect. And a lot of times people are so afraid to accept their bad behavior or to accept the reality as it is or to accept their flawed selves as they are because they think that, well, if I accept it, then I'm never going to change. Hi. Hey, how are you? One are second you? video. Very good. Thank you. How are you? Good, 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 good. Good to see you again. Good to see you. So I wanted to go back to the trauma that you were talking about from childhood. Mm -hmm. and, sure. And you mentioned that it doesn't always have to be an acute trauma. It can be uh, repetitive trauma. Some like little, yeah. little like things. paper cuts. What's yeah. That? Like paper cuts, you know, that like small yeah. things that create this massive wound inside. Yeah, and, and it, would, it would make sense to me if, if the accumulation of all these paper cut traumas was actually more difficult to, to deal with because um, if it was an acute trauma, like a car crash or you were hit or, you know, or, yeah. or you, uh, like a relationship falls apart, you can kind of, it would be easier to identify it. Yeah. Do you, do you see that? Is it, are there certain, um, is self-worth easier to reclaim if it's, if it's from uh, acute trauma or if it's from the paper cuts? Usually self-worth is from paper cuts, as yeah. I see it. Usually it's some sort of behaviors, you know, like the way parents treated them or something kept happening like in the childhood. So it's usually these small things and almost every single human like struggles with self-worthiness but it's all on the spectrum so it's not like you either like self-worthy or you're not and even if you have high self-worth maybe there will be certain situations in your life where you will be triggered or something like some memories will come back so you will not be you know feeling really great or sometimes it's um, it's about also your state of mind or maybe you like you feeling great all at the time but and you've done a lot of healing a lot of work but then you get either tired or stressed or hungry or triggered something happens and then your worthiness goes down so it's never like black and white and it's really hard to measure it and compare it because every single person is different and everyone is going through their own path mm -hmm. so i don't think it you can really like compare because there's not there's no measure like, oh, your self-worthiness is at level eight, you know? That's, <laughs> right, right. Yeah, so it's, it's different for every single person. But I guess the, the point here is not to compare with, with anyone else and not even to compare it to yourself, but just about being gentle with yourself. And even, you know, your self-worthiness is not at the best today. The first step is to just be accepted and be really gentle and loving with yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'm, I'm thinking also your self-worthiness could be divided into the different aspects of your life. So yeah. I might have super high confidence in my ability to do my job, but maybe less confidence in my ability to relate to like, well, in my case, to relate to older people. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And we all have this, like these differences in different areas of life. And for me, for example, like I always felt that I was really smart. I don't know, my dad maybe did a good job convincing me, like conditioning me, like I'm really smart. And I think that's why I did really well at school. And if someone came and told me like, Are you stupid, that wouldn't even touch me the slightest because I have this belief about myself, whether it's true or not, that, you know, I'm really smart. So it doesn't touch me. But if someone came and told me like, oh, you're ugly or you look fat or whatever, that would touch me because that was my wound from my teenage years and my childhood. So I mm -hmm. felt like I'm not pretty enough. I'm not good enough. So that would affect me. And I've done a lot of healing now, so it doesn't affect me anymore. But I guess there's still areas in life when if someone came and told me something, I would be like, you know, affected. And if I really have this strong belief about myself, then it doesn't matter. And I guess this is another opportunity to see that, you know, all these triggers are just indicating that something is unhealed within. So it's never about the outside world or that someone is here to blame, like for triggering us or whatever. It's like, it's always just a reflection of what's happening inside and normally some unhealed wound. So how much of a, um, of a spiritual quality is the coaching? Like, like when you're talking to somebody, is it just about 
forgiving your parents or is it like the angels are coming in to help you align yourself to spirit and abundance and the universe and stuff like that? Yeah, so it's hard to say like percentage wise. So I, I don't talk about the angels and I don't call in the angels for help. And I think we are all, you know, we all have this, this higher self, whatever your beliefs are. So I'm not really religious. I believe, you know, all the religious kind of are the same, talking about the same thing. So whatever resonates with you. And some people are a bit more spiritual and more woo-woo as you call it. So I will use that in a bit different language. Some people are more like black and white. So I would use the same language, but it's the same principles really. It's about that self-awareness and knowing who you really are and connecting with your purpose and understanding your soul's lessons. If you are more spiritual or your life lessons, if you're more black and white, but it's kind of the same, the same thing. So I don't even, I don't have, I don't see that distinction between what's spiritual and what's mindset so for me it's like all the same thing and it's all about this holistic view and again it's all about self-awareness and understanding your patterns your limiting beliefs the intention behind you know all your limiting beliefs and these protection mechanisms and really understanding why you're here on this earth what are you doing here what are your soul's lessons and you know what are your next steps and then seeing what's working in your life, what's not working in your life and kind of deleting the old conditioning, the old beliefs and building the new ones and rewriting your story and then changing your identity. So it's hard to say what is spiritual. You can say everything is spiritual or nothing is spiritual. It's just, I don't try to divide it if that makes sense. Right. Well, from a certain perspective, if you only have one life, you incarnate mm -hmm. one time, yeah. That's a different way of treating someone than if they are incarnating in cycles. Because there's a belief, if you're incarnating in cycles, that some of the limiting traumas that you could be dealing with now are mm -hmm. not actually from your life. So you yeah. actually have to go back to a previous lifetime to, to address them. Well, you don't have to go to a previous lifetime. And you don't have to even go to everything that happened to you. You just have to understand how your subconscious mind works, how it creates these protection mechanisms and these sabotaging patterns. And you understand it and you love it. So that's why like, in order to really heal it, you have to heal your own sabotaging, love your own sabotaging behaviors and these beliefs and traumas and patterns. And with love, you can heal that. And you don't have to go back to your past lives because... To be honest, like we can't really do that. You know, there's maybe some practitioners who can take you there, but who knows, maybe just going into your subconscious mind and maybe just these symbols. So it's, it's what I've seen, you know, I don't go into past lives with my clients, but what I've seen, like if you really get committed to the self-love and holding space for yourself, reparenting yourself and, you know, going back to your childhood traumas and like holding space for yourself, that's when the healing happens. Mm. So. so something something that you had just said, which I, I feel like has been really transformational for me, yeah. is, is identifying behaviors or thoughts about oneself or myself and then just saying that's okay. Yeah. Which is really, really hard because the whole reason why you go into that vein of practice or that um, that pursuit is that I want to get rid of this part of myself. I don't yeah. like, like it. But then eventually turning around after all this struggle and saying, I guess it's fine. <laughs> yeah. And this is the actual, the, actually like this is the main thing that heals. This is the most important aspect. And a lot of times people are so afraid to accept their bad behavior or to accept the reality as it is or to accept their flawed selves as they are because they think that, well, if I accept it, then I'm never going to change. Mm -hmm. So that's where that resistance comes in. And that's why people resist the reality. They don't accept reality as it is. They resist themselves. And when you resist it, you know, there's a saying, if whatever you resist persists. And it creates this stagnant energy, which actually cannot allow this change to happen. So first step is to always really allow it, whatever it is to be, whatever you are right now, just allow yourself to be as you are and allow reality to be as it is. And it doesn't mean that you're making it right. It doesn't mean that this behavior is right or good. 
you don't give yourself green light to go and do it again, but just accept it like it's okay that I went through this. It's okay that reality is it is as it is, and it's okay to be a human. And I just yeah. did whatever you know I could in a moment. We all do the best that we can because if we knew better, we would do. Mm -hmm. So just kind of accepting that we're just all cute little humans just going through life, trying to do our best. We're all flawed. We all have these traumas, beliefs, patterns, and it's okay. And once you really accept that, only then you can take next steps and can transform it. And oh. yeah. Oh, so, so something that was actually really difficult in, in my process was being aware of this concept okay if i accept it then then i can move on from this yeah but that was actually there's a there's a really subtle trick there you yeah know? i'm only going to accept it so that i can move on from it which is not actually accepting it it's like this little yeah trying to play on yourself <laughs> yeah yeah i know that so it's the, the kind of the hack is just to say like it's okay to feel this way and it's even okay to feel that I'm accepting it because I want to change it. I see it. I see uh -huh. this whole thing and I see the whole subtle, you know, ego or whatever you want to call it going back through, you know, through the back door and just kind of, I see it all and I see what's happening and I still accept everything because I trust in the goodness of my heart and I trust in my good intentions. Mm. So whatever is happening, I allow everything. I don't need to push any parts of it, just whatever, all this nonsense that's happening in my mind. Wow. And just kind of, you can approach it with curiosity and just fascination with the weirdness of the human mind. Cause sometimes it does just the craziest tricks because if you try to like push away any parts of it, it's not full acceptance. So accepting non-acceptance, which sounds like a bit ironic, but these paradoxes, they don't have to be like, they can, they can be aligned. It doesn't have to be this or that can be both i accept myself or not accepting myself this is one step closer to acceptance yeah. if that makes sense and okay. as long as you just like just come back to that you know knowing that i have good intentions i trust in the goodness of my heart mm -hmm. that's where that transformation can happen from that place so i'm curious about you personally um what is it that you're working on what I'm working on, taking my business to the next level and kind of going through that ceiling because I've reached, you know, my goals and like what I think is possible. So I'm quite comfortable right now. I love my life. I, like I live, I moved back in London last year. I went through a lot of like personal transitions. Like, you know, I'm always working on myself. So I left like a 10 year relationship last year because that no longer felt in alignment, although it was a great relationship. And I moved from comfortable life in Bali, moved back to London, which is way more kind of chaotic, but I felt this is really an alignment to be here. So I'm always like practicing what I preach. But right now it's taking my business to the next level again and just going through that ceiling and through like my own limitations and my own beliefs, what is possible for me. So doing more like speaking gigs, launching my new online program, which has been like a process of creation for like more than a year. So just doing more things in, the, in terms of, you know, professional life and also relationships. I'm still learning through that. So I went through, all, you know, after being 10 years in a relationship and like dating and new relationships and I'm just learning so much, which is fascinating, but at the same time, quite intense as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So how, how was it clear to you that your relationship was over? Yeah. So I did a lot of, inner work and just kind of connecting with my true self doing different you know practices like meditation and you know meeting my future self and all their practices and the message was really clear like it served its purpose it's ready to move on so you know it's it's easy to leave a relationship when it's bad or it's abusive but when it's good i'm very very comfortable that's when it's really challenging but then my motivation was like, I'm teaching people how to be in alignment with themselves. I cannot do this work and not be in alignment with myself. It was really difficult, but I just like, I had to trust and make that leap of faith. And not just leaving a relationship, but also leaving like my life in Bali, which is, you know, on a tropical island and it's beautiful and easy and everything is so 
flowy, whereas like, as I said, living in the city, it's a bit more challenging, but I love it. And when I arrived, it just felt it's so, I'm so in alignment and I understand why I needed to be here because it's better for my next career moves. And it's like people that I needed to meet that makes sense now. Although at the time, like my intuition is just telling me to move back to London and to leave this relationship and to do different things with my business. I don't know how it's going to work, but just have to like have faith and trust. Mm -hmm. So do you have a a coach or a mentor yourself? Yeah. So I have a few coaches because you know, you can't be a heart surgeon on yourself and you may have a lot of self-awareness, but I still, you know, need some, some guidance and some help with different things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree with that. I, I myself have a mentor that, um, well, a few, but one, one specifically that I, that I work with on a, on a regular basis and he's been instrumental, you know, in my development these last couple of years. Yeah. And throughout my whole kind of journey, I worked with different coaches some of them are more beneficial than others but i think you always need that guidance or support whether it's a coach a mentor or a tribe and like your community Mm because you can't just yeah we humans we are social beings we need help from one another so one of the things that we had talked about before that i that i wanted to bring up again i mean in our in our other conversation yeah was um This, the sense of self-worth as it relates to the trauma of abandonment. Mm-hmm. And, and I've been seeing that come up a lot. Uh, I think that I've, I've personally experienced that. I mean, definitely I have, but, but I've seen it come up a lot in other people. And I, and I work as a mentor with, with boys that, that it's very, very clear that they're, that they've experienced abandonment as a trauma and then also the way that it affects their self-esteem. You know, you try to get them to say yeah. something nice about themselves and they just can't do it, mm. uh, which is, just, is heartbreaking. So, yeah. um, so what's the process of, of easing that trauma? Yeah. So first of all, it's about understanding how it happened and why it happened. So when you are a little baby, when you are born, you don't have any self-esteem issues. You think like, I'm worthy of getting all my needs met. So babies like expect to be warm, to be fed, to be, you know, to get everything that they want. And if they don't get it, they just scream. And they don't think like, oh, I'm not good enough today. Like my cheeks are a little bit too chubby. Like they don't think that. They're just like babies have complete self-worthiness. It's our birthright. And we are born with absolutely perfect self-worthiness. But then when your needs are not met, and you don't, you know, you feel abandoned or neglected or you don't get what you want, then we need to figure it out in our heads, kind of find the explanation why it happens. Because it's too hard, like it's impossible almost to live in a world where, which doesn't make sense. Because then we would be so confused and unsafe. So we always try to allow our subconscious mind to find these explanations. And usually what happens, the children then kind of create the subconscious belief, well, I must not be worthy of love. That's why my mommy and daddy doesn't love me or doesn't give me what I want. So I'm not worthy of that. That's where that belief or that kind of core wound gets formed when your needs are not met. And then when you feel that you're not worthy, you go through life and you create and manifest these situations to kind of to collect the supportive evidence why you're not worthy. So it's all about, in order to heal that, it's all about not trying to get these things from the outside world because that's subconsciously if we're not aware, we go and try to get the validation and, you know, support from others, which can work. You can get love from someone else, but if someone else is giving you that love and if you are just relying on that, then they can always take it away. So you don't have that power and then you just, you're vulnerable and you are powerless. So it's all about cultivating that in yourself and just holding space for yourself and being there for yourself. So kind of one of the practical things that you can do is just listing all the needs that you have that you want to get from others, whether it's like validation, respect, feeling seen, feeling heard and understood, and then going and giving it to yourself and finding ways how you can give it to yourself. And that was my biggest kind of work throughout the years, just like listing all the things that I want to get from others and giving it to myself. And whenever, like, especially 
situations where things are not going your way and when you feel really either stressed or anxious or heartbroken. So this is the time when people just naturally check out and almost the spirit leaves the body or you just kind of judge yourself even more. But this is the time to really transform that self-worth, to really hold space for yourself and not try to get yourself out of pain necessarily, but sit with pain and just say to yourself, like, I can see you're struggling. I know this sucks. This is really tough, but I'm here for you. Other people may abandon you. Other people may neglect you. But you know what? I'm never going to abandon you. I'm never going to turn your back again. For the rest of our life, I'm going to be there for you. So just being your own parent, reparenting yourself, holding that space for yourself, especially in the situations when it's hard, if you can do that and not check out, not judge yourself, that's where that transformation happens. And now it's been, I don't know, like two years maybe since I haven't had a single negative self-talk or like thought about myself but it's not because i'm just naturally you know just happens to me but because i practice it and especially through these hardest moments when you like your whole life is falling apart you're on your knees you're crying you're like judging yourself you're not happy about yourself this is the time to really practice that self-worth again as we discussed about these like three steps so this is kind of a step number two when shit hits a fan where it's really hard this is a time to show what you're made of. And when you can, you know, and again, it's like easy to love yourself when you like yourself, the way you look and all the things that you're doing. But when you don't like yourself, when you're procrastinating, when you are, you know, in pain, this is a time to really hold that space for yourself, mm. which is not easy. But if you stick to it, that's when the, it becomes your default and you change that self-worthiness and then no one can take it away from you. Mm. So when you're having these conversations of I love you and I'm here for you and, and is that yeah. is that something that you do as a as a daily affirmation? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And uh this is like the first thing in the morning I wake up, I do my mantras, uh like kind of setting the intention and always just connecting with my body because most of us, especially women, most of the time we spend out of our body, just like in our head and just completely disconnected and just neglecting everything because either we don't like our bodies or it's too painful or it's just uncomfortable. So it's about like I start with like really connecting, like kind of scanning the whole body from the toes and everywhere and just kind of sending love to all parts of myself, practicing loving kindness meditation on myself then sending good intentions to everyone else and just kind of reassuring to myself and just being you know, whatever I want for my partner to be or for my parents or whatever I want from any, everyone else, first giving it to myself. Mm. Just feeling seen, just telling myself all the nicest words that I want to hear. And this has become such a default. And now just like I wake up, I'm like, oh, thank you. You're welcome <laughs> for waking up. And just being super gentle. Yeah. With myself. Yeah. Yeah. You know, this, this sounds like, I was trying to give a friend of mine advice of, yeah. of, that was having a lot of bad relationships in a row and complaining, I'm not being treated well. And I said, you have to treat yourself in such a way yeah. that it sets a standard that you don't tolerate people that don't live up to that standard. So yeah. I, I really like that advice that you're saying, yeah. that, you know, hold yourself to that standard and, and you're accountable because it's you that's doing it. Yeah. And I live by this quote, like you deserve what you tolerate oh, yeah. and you set the standard and the way you treat yourself and the way you respect yourself, you set the standard, how other people would treat you and respect you. Cause it's ridiculous to think like I can hate myself. I can beat myself up, not respect myself, but I expect someone else to come and give that love and respect to me. That just like, doesn't make any sense. So if you want to change anything on the outside, whether it's relationship or business, career, you have to start with yourself. And another practical exercise that I do with my clients and always myself also, I kind of list the things that I'm not happy about that frustrate me or annoy me and then kind of in a bullet point fashion. And then with every single point, I ask myself, how is this reflected in my relationship with myself? Mm. And I haven't seen a single case like in my own life and with my clients where that would not be the case and it's not necessarily directly but it's always like subtle ways so for example someone just is always late or they don't fulfill their promises oh so is there any 
where you let any area of my life where I don't fulfill my own promises. Oh, I'm telling myself I'm going to do these things and I have these plans, but I then keep postponing them. Okay, so in order to really fix that on the outside, I need to fix this with myself. Oh, and so you're taking responsibility for everything that's happening. And it's not easy because you lose the ability to blame everyone else. And you, you know, then you are responsible for your whole life. But then you also take your power back and you have the power to change absolutely anything. Yeah, it sounds like two things that probably most people don't want to hear and might get angry with you. Yeah. You're responsible for everything and you deserve what you tolerate. That's a big yeah. one. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it is very uncomfortable. But if you really accept that and start living by that, then you'll see like your life becomes amazing if you can really get committed to yourself because you're taking your power back so you're not dependent on everyone and anyone else mm. you can choose your own reality and that's yeah that's my biggest belief that we all create our own reality that's that's awesome and i and i'd like to uh i'd like to conclude on that note sure um, very empowering now that it's it's a beautiful message um so, yeah, I, I really appreciate you taking the time to, to chat with me about this stuff. I love yeah. it. Yeah, it was my pleasure.